Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome. It's a wonderful evening uh, in the life of Policy Exchange to be able to welcome back to Policy Exchange two key figures uh, in the life of the organization. The Chancellor, one of our founding fathers back in 2002, Charles Moore, our distinguished former chairman from uh, 2005 through to 2011. It's going to be a great evening. It's going to be a great evening, particularly because we're inverting uh, the normal logic of things, because it's the Chancellor who will be interviewing Charles on this occasion. <laughs> and uh, we'll now see whether uh, Charles, who dishes it out so regularly, mm. can actually take it. So uh, <laughs> welcome uh, to both men. Please join me in applauding them again and uh, enjoy what I know will be a wonderful evening. Well, thank you very much, Dean, and uh, it's wonderful to be here in this uh, historic uh, lecture theatre. Uh, and uh, congratulations to Charles, who has done it again with a uh, brilliant second volume of his uh, book about Margaret Thatcher. And I was wondering, Charles, I mean, here we are. You've been uh, editing great newspapers in your life. Uh, you are the greatest living Englishman, as everyone knows. Uh, uh, I'm quite busy, and yet we've uh, chosen to... Uh, do this interview, is there any other politician that you can think of uh, that we would be discussing like this? Is there anyone else who has so dominated our, our recent history that uh, you would have devoted 18 years of your life to <laughs> writing a book about? Um, before I answer that, could I just thank you very much? And I would normally, out of respect, call you Chancellor, but you're always trained in modern interviews that you must call the interview by his Christian Please name. Call so I'll me call George. you George, if I, yes. if I may. <laughs> um, yes, I, I think... Um, I mean, no is the answer. She is undoubtedly the most interesting um, post-war prime minister, unless you include Churchill as a post-war prime minister. Um, and in fact, in, in peacetime prime minister, she's more interesting than Churchill. Um, and so I think there isn't a comparable... I suppose the ones that you really would want to read about are, in the, in the last century, are Churchill, Thatcher, and Lloyd George. Um, and, uh, and, of course, she has the obvious unique point that she is the one and only woman. And do, how is your view different now of her than when you were, of course, covering her and, uh, at the time? And how has your view changed since the end of the first book? I mean, or has it just confirmed um, suspicions, prejudices, <laughs> and the like? Um, I think um, what I was not fully aware of, of two things. One is that she was much more cunning than uh, she let on. And part of her cunning was never, ever to tell anyone that she was cunning, not even a private person, um, which, is, which is very uh, clever of her. Um, and the other thing, which I didn't understand very well, is even at this, her zenith, how um, precarious she felt. And, of course, this is partly why she survived, because she always, always knew that she wasn't part of the club. Nobody would catch her if she fell. Mm. And so she has an interesting conversation here when she says, just after the 83 election, a fantastic smashing victory, um, that uh, she knows her colleagues are going to try and get her out by the next election. And she doesn't blame them. She says, I don't blame them. She didn't blame them, but she certainly wasn't going to let them. Right. <laughs> um, and in your view, do most politicians think they're unassailable? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I try not to um, psychoanalyze uh, current, <laughs> current ones. I'm busy on a past one. Right. Uh. Um, in the... Uh, <laughs> well, I have to turn somewhere else then. No, the, um, uh, and yes, so between the first and second book, did, did that vulnerability come out? Had you assumed... Because, of course, you leave the second... The, the first book ends really at an at a period where she's no longer vulnerable, having been extremely vulnerable, yes. if I yeah. remember. Uh, you know, yeah. And you, you finish right. after the Falklands victory. Mm. Um, and so uh, does that come as a surprise when you're doing this research? Well, well of course, it's sort of obvious in, in that she'd be vulnerable to start with because of inexperience and isolation. But what's a surprise in this volume is this total mastery, electorally, in policy, in a global role, and yet this... Danger, 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 right. and indeed, some terrible errors and 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 real danger to herself in Westland. I think. Well, we're we're going to come on to those. Um, you call the book um, uh, "Everything She Wants," which is a, a wham song. It is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did you? Uh, 
<laughs> you were a fan so of Wham so at the time? Or, um, no, I have to confess that um, I, was told, I, was, I was told about it by somebody else. Um, <laughs> I, I, I do remember um, hearing a, Sir Harold Acton being interviewed, and for some reason it came up in the interview, and he said, I'm very fond of the whams. <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh, um, now, you don't actually, um, you don't have a question mark after it. It's just asserted. And, of course, one of the things you learn yeah. in this book is she never, she never uses a question mark in any of the annotations she makes on, Quite right. on government minutes uh, yeah. and whatever. Uh, so is there any, is this just an assertion? She gets everything she wants? No, or is, I, it, is, no. there, is there a question mark in the title? I thought it was a good title. I think there is a question mark or an irony. Um, this is about the era when she could, in theory, get everything she wants. I mean, it's an unbelievable dominance. Mm. But, actually, she often didn't. I mean, that's as I don't need to tell you the nature of government, but it's also particularly to do with the immense difficulties of the problems uh, she was dealing with. Uh, and you're right. What she always writes on, on memos all the time, she often writes questions, but she doesn't seem to know that the question mark exists. Yes. So they, they're written as questions, but without the interrogative. Right, well spotted. Um, <laughs> and I guess, you know, would you say, I mean, maybe this is an impossible thing to ask of anyone, even though you've studied her, does she get, does she feel fulfilled as Prime Minister? Do you think she looks she, back, mm. maybe as she's approaching the general election in, in 87, does she feel she's achieved uh, a lot of what she wants. Is she a fulfilled person or is she restless and unfulfilled? Well, certainly always re restless, but I think it's a very good question. And there was a moment which Bernard Ingham described to me in 1986. He couldn't date it exactly. When he, moment, he remembered a moment of joy when she was speaking to him. And she said, I really think it's working. The, the, all the economic reform we're trying to bring through is working. Mm -hmm. um, and what she really meant by that was the sort of irreversibility the, the fact that these ideas and policies had really taken root mm. and that Britain was changing as a result. And she almost had a sort of epiphany about that. Um, uh, so there was that moment of fulfilment, but nobody could be less likely to sit around resting on their laurels or be at ease. Uh, so on she went. And, um, of course, we, we, will, we await the, uh, the third volume in this uh, Robert Caro-esque uh, <laughs> endeavour you've embarked on. But um, the seeds of decline, are, I mean, this is the apogee. Mm. This is the, mm -hmm. the high point. Yeah. Um, and you bookend the book with uh, two um, general election landslides. Uh, do we detect the seeds of decline here? Is it, or, is that, or is that actually just a combination um, of events that we're going to read about in your third volume? I don't think we detect the seeds of decline in her mental powers at all. I mean, I don't obviously mean when she actually became, you know, ill yeah. in her yeah. old age, but just, I think in the last period, you see a decline in her powers of sort of doing things in a sensible manner to yeah. some extent. You don't really see that here, except in the 1987 election campaign when she sort of went mad with anxiety. Um, but what you do see We, we never did that. No. <laughs> <laughs> we were so calm right up until the... <laughs> well, I can't ever imagine that you in particular ever had something quite like this extraordinary wobbly Thursday in 1987. Um, it was like wobbly Monday, Tuesday, yeah. Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, uh, well, yes, well, you tell us. But um, uh, what she did, um, what you do see is the fracturing, the friction of relationships with senior colleagues. And that, beco that becomes a definite trend uh, of which there were small signs in the first period, but much, much less. And it's to do with the passage of time, her dominance, her feeling that she succeeded by doing what people told her not to do. Um, and, of course, the fact that she becomes more and more senior. Um, and so, obviously, it's Geoffrey Howe. Everything went wrong with Geoffrey. Mm. Um, uh, and though history would criticize him in many ways, you'd have to say it was more her fault than his in terms of the personal relationship. Mm. And though this was a marvellous period with Nigel Lawson of cooperation in many ways, you already see a trouble coming there, um, particularly about the ERM. And also very interesting with Norman Tebbit, you know, such an ally in, in, in the political sphere, but actually quite a poor personal relation, and which gets very bad. It became very, very difficult with approaching the election. Um, 
And I think this is, was very largely to do with fear of these people wanting her job. Um, you know, broadly speaking, without identifying necessarily these individuals, um, they did want it. <laughs> <laughs> Which won't surprise you, but... Uh, well... <laughs> I was, uh, I was going to come on to how chancellors bring um, prime ministers down, but maybe I will. <laughs> um, I mean, the, the, okay, the, 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 um, obviously the first book, and, you know, and um, we pay respects to, uh, to him and his family because he's just died. Jeffrey Howe is obviously yeah. a big feature in the first book. Mm. Uh, Nigel Lawson features a, a lot in this book. I notice uh, we have uh, his son here in the front row. Um, I mean, this relationship seems pretty pivotal, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and a lot of the drama, which I'll come on and ask you about some specific um, uh, events, uh, pivots around this relationship. Mm. Uh, she clearly thinks, as you describe it, uh, he's extremely clever, he's her ally, uh, he's providing a lot of the intellectual firepower mm. for the government, but I thought there was an interesting description of him in here, uh, which is that he's a gambler. Yeah. Yeah, and that is not a word I would have, you know, immediately associated with Nigel or thought that Margaret Thatcher might have thought that mm. about Nigel. So mm. could you explain that, that and this crucial relationship at the heart of this period of her premiership? It all came out of a very good relationship because he was a sort of proto-Thatcherite who could uh, conceptualise these things better than she could, you know, being more intellectual and sort of more of a disciplined mind. Uh, and it was completely brilliant on... Uh, the economic theory and, and expanding it. Um, and I think she also, as well as all the things you said, she actually did like him very much. She was, he, she was very pleased, as it were, when he came into the room. You know, there's a sort of... She's very almost animal in her reactions, and that, that was a favourable one. But she did think he was a gambler, and she, well, she came to think that. And I think, obviously, this was all to do with, really, his movement against monetarism hmm. uh, and the idea that, um, that monetary targets didn't work. And also, I think his jealousy, which was very understandable because he wants to do the job um, rather than getting her to do the job, of um, that he should work all this out rather than her sort of backseat driving. Um, and this became stronger because they were disagreeing. And in the middle of this period that I'm talking about, um, this became quite acute, and it, uh, actually very acute, in 1985 because of the, the first really big opening of the ERM argument. Mm. And there's this uh, very, very important meeting in November uh, 1985 when Nigel um, had really got together the whole British establishment to tell her that the Britain should enter the ERM. And, and due to um, poor sort of Sherpa work by her people, um, she was trapped in this meeting with virtually no support. I think John Biffin was the only cabinet minister who supported her. And so they had this extraordinary meeting in which um, the prime minister is out, not that it took, was put to the vote, but was heavily, heavily outvoted mm. by all the others. You know, Nigel had squared Willie Whitelaw and, and, and the bank, governor of the Bank of England, the foreign secretary, mm. uh, Geoffrey, all of them. And um, so a profoundly embarrassing moment um, and one that she would never forget and he would never forget. And therefore, from then on, they wanted to sort of didn't really want to have the argument because it was too dangerous. And she simply said, no, I won't have it, more or less saying, over my dead body. And so there was a paralysis at the heart of government on this subject, mm. which really continued for the whole oh, of the rest is. of her time. Yeah. No, I, it's, I um, alighted on the meeting of the 13th mm. of November very, uh, as one big. of the most mm. interesting section, mm. bits in the book, mm. one of the bits I tagged. Mm. Um, and what is uh, striking for us, who, and maybe this is something about, you know, you'll turn to in the third book, but the sort of mythology of Thatcherism and Thatcherites and the Thatcher disciples uh, is, of course, very powerful, particularly in my party, but also just generally in British politics. And yet you look at the people in this meeting who speak out against Margaret Thatcher mm. uh, and uh, you know, um, support Nigel Lawson on ERM membership, and it includes Willie Whitelaw, Leon Britton, Norman Tebbit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So... It's a remarkable meeting, yes. and she is completely isolated. But is it, no. how does she, what, is it, you say it's just poor Sherpa work. Um, how does she end up in a position where on this absolutely central economic issue, she's A, uh, on the wrong side of her chancellor, or the mm. chancellor's on the wrong side of her, depending mm. on how you put it, and suddenly she's lost most of her government. The issue, of course, isn't poor Sherpa work. It's the way the meeting worked. 
Um, but I think it was because, though this argument was not conducted in these terms, it was always conducted at this time in technical terms, she fundamentally hated the idea on a political level uh, and a sort of principle level of getting, uh, of handing over the control of the currency to any European hmm. uh, institution or set of rules. But she does write and, to Ronald Reagan. Yes. Trying to get him to intervene she, she got to so, support yes. the value of sterling. Quite. So she's not against uh, well, exchange rate control absolutely, because or that, management. That's her, I mean, she was pretty much against it, but she panicked sometimes. At the particular <laughs> occasion was... Um, does that occasionally that, happen that was nearly, exchange rate management. Exactly. <laughs> Quite, and uh, it nearly got to pound dollar parity in January '85, and um, so uh, she was she was in a panic, and that all, almost persuaded her we should go into the RM at that point, just out of sheer nerves. But I think in the end she just was not. The doctrine was the policy was we'll enter when the time is ripe. But you find her in these private meetings saying, "Can't we get rid of this stupid phrase? We don't want to enter." And and uh, the others didn't agree. There was a fundamental underlying disagreement so deep that they couldn't really express it. Right. Uh, and then there's the poll tax. Um, and uh, what's your advice to a chancellor who finds that uh, <laughs> there's a terrible policy being implemented by the government? Do you try and make it work or do you uh, kill it off? <laughs> <laughs> well, Nigel, Nigel didn't, um, didn't do it right, I guess, um, or, or so it would seem, though, of course, his arguments against the poll tax were brilliant. And there's a great memo he wrote about it. But he sort of, what do you have to remember about all this? Sorry, it's all going on at the same time. Mm. The CRM thing. No, you do bring uh, that up. And, I mean, and the poll tax, and the poll tax route, and Westland yeah. blowing up. Um, uh, so everything's very awkward and difficult. And they're all very fed up with her. That's part of it all. Um, and he, uh, it must be very annoying, the poll tax, because as you know, sorry, of course you know, um, the um, uh, local government taxation was not the Chancellor's business. Yeah. And so he, why should he get involved in some stupid tax which he can't control? Um, so what he wants to, wanted to do really was just stop it, and, but for good principle reasons as well. But instead of getting stuck into the argument and swaying everything, he made his point and sort of sulked in his tent. And so what you saw, people say that... This was all done on the back of a fag packet. It wasn't at all. It was iterated and iterated and iterated with masses of brilliant intellectuals and officials and mm. huge amount of work done on it, but not the cooperation of the Treasury. And um, you know, however much people hate the Treasury, you do really have to have the cooperation of it uh, when you're doing things about money, don't you think? Yeah. A, <laughs> Broadly yeah. speaking, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. I actually, I spoke today, as it happens, not, not about this uh, event, with uh, both Nigel Lawson and Oliver Letwin on separate subjects. Uh, who would you uh, trust? Whose judgment would you trust? Because they, um, <laughs> they, um, they find themselves at odds in this uh, key event. Yes. Yes, they do. <laughs> and, um... I mean, just for my own personal sake. <laughs> well, I was Oliver's best man at his wedding, and... And Is that had, good judgment uh, uh, or bad and, judgment? And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and he at mine, so um, I better say nothing more. <laughs> um, then there's the, the Westland um, affair. And it's actually, it's, I mean, I was, I was a teenager at the time, but it, it brought back the incredible complexity of the, um, uh, the story. You know, you have to read, the, read it, and, and, and it takes a while to realize why this is such a, yeah. a, a crisis. I, I guess one of the sort of, you know, you're not you're not writing a um, you know a, a, you're not trying to write a, a, a sort of anything like a, a hatchet job on Margaret Thatcher or try and exposing uh, expose her, but you do stumble across or come across uh, you know through diligent work a quite key fact in the whole Westland story mm. because yeah. of, uh, because you track down the the woman who leaks uh, <coughs> the Solicitor General's uh, letter. Mm. Uh, which is at the heart of the, the problems that forced Margaret Thatcher to the Commons and mm. almost ended her premiership. Mm. I mean, uh, does she mislead the House of Commons with hindsight? I think, I think, I think yes is the short answer. Um, because um, uh, Mrs. Thatcher, under such enormous pressure because of, leaking the, the, because of the leak of this letter, instituted an inquiry about it conducted by Robert Armstrong. And... Colette Bow, uh, who has told her story for the first time in this book, who had to do the actual leaking, um, couldn't understand why there was an inquiry into the leak because 
Number 10 knew perfectly well why it had been leaked. And so Mrs. Satcho had to conduct the leak inquiry because otherwise the Solicitor General would have resigned, the Attorney General would have resigned, uh, and that would have been the end of her. And Robert Armstrong, therefore, had to construct um, a brilliant uh, p sort of report which managed to... Um, he has some brilliant phrase, I can't get it quite right, about different understandings between the Department of Trade and, the, and uh, <laughs> number 10 about what happened. <laughs> Much better, clever phrase, very clever Mandarin phrase, better than misunderstanding, because that misunderstanding blames someone yeah. in some way, just different understandings. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> um, and he was good at those kind of... Brilliant. Uh, I mean, uh, what, a, what a servant... The truth type of what a servant, yes, but in, in, for me, talking to me about this, he was prodigal with the truth, so I'm very grateful right. to him. Um, but uh, so... And what Colette Bow actually had, as all this was coming, was a direct message uh, brought to her from Number 10, giving, before the inquiry, but after the leak, giving Number 10 approval. Yes. So I'm not saying that Mrs. Satcher knew exactly how this was done, etc., etc., but the point is... Um, in the words of the great Charles Pearl himself, her hands were not entirely clean. Yes, and in this incredible tension of this moment, this is in a way a minor thing, but in the incredible tension of this moment, it would have, I think, probably had her out. If yeah. it had been, oh, well, that if was my next known. question. If yeah. this had been yeah. known at the time, she would have resigned. I think so, because remember... And of course, that would have changed this whole period of British history. Exactly. And because her reputation was for this sort of honesty. It wouldn't have been a two-volume book. <laughs> yeah, no, quite. <laughs> her reputation was for honesty, and it looked shabby. And it's clear that people, obviously Michael Heseltine, but less obviously, but truly, Geoffrey Howe wanted her to go at that point. Geoffrey wanted to succeed her, which she well knew, uh, and it was a very dangerous moment. There's, uh, the, the, the chapter on the miners' strike does bring back... Uh, and bring home to anyone who lived through that period just how brutal it is. And I think at one point you use the description, or, uh, or um, one of the people you interviewed, uh, David Willits, uses the description that it's like um, a sort of Shakespearean mm. civil war. Mm. Um, and then you make an interesting uh, observation that having won the battle, in, because the miners go back to work, or the NUM go back to work, you, you make actually very clear that she's all, the people she's really on the side of are the working miners. Yes. But yeah. when the NUM goes back to work, you say that she essentially then uh, sort of departs the field of battle, that mm. she doesn't try and win yeah. the story of the miners' strike. Mm. Uh, and as you put it, it's left to sort of Billy Elliot yeah. and, and that description. I mean, is that a, 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 an error? Or as you put it, are they actually rather embarrassed by the kind of bitterness and the division of the previous year? It's very interesting, isn't it? I mean, if modern politicians were dealing with this, um, they wouldn't have been strong enough to win the strike, but they would have been much better at spinning it. <laughs> um, and um, uh, the... Well, right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, 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 right. Uh, and... Uh, uh, <laughs> um, uh, she was advised, and I can understand why, that she should sort of shut up about it afterwards because everybody needed to calm down. Yeah. But the trouble with that was that a myth could be created. And I think the key thing, which she managed well during the strike, but not in the aftermath, was the enormous need, and colleagues too, to remind everybody why this happened, which was because Arthur Scargill didn't have a ballot, uh, and, because the, and therefore the working miners went on working. And therefore, first of all, the working miners attracted her admiration, but also the strike was fundamentally illegitimate. And she didn't win it just because of her very good plans about what they call endurance with coal stocks or the reform yeah. of the law or the, or the business of the police. Uh, she won it because it was an illegitimate strike and because Scargill presented a direct political challenge where he said he wanted to bring down the government. And these, these messages need to be banged home and they have been forgotten or deliberately obscured. And while, as you mentioned, I'm very critical of her in many aspects of the book, I think she deserves tremendous praise for the conduct of the miners' strike. I think it was not extreme. She wasn't seeking the battle, and she just knew how to fight it, and she was very disciplined and very determined and did so. And at the end of it, you know, apart from anything else, she was very tired. I mean, it was, it's a year. Of, it's a real war. Mm. Um, and, uh, and I think history will show that she was right about it, but that it was rather uh, thrown away the lessons were perhaps thrown away. Or, or the myth, let's say the myth. 
Mm. So, so about two weeks ago, I went to the site of the Orgreave Colliery, mm. where there's now an incredible uh, science mm. and technology park. Mm. And uh, it was... Um, uh, you know, it was noticed by everyone. I was actually meeting local Labour leaders there mm -hmm. in South Yorkshire. And uh, the very fact that a Conservative Chancellor could go to the Orgreave Colliery site and have a you know, good meeting with, uh, with uh, Labour leaders. But that has taken a long time. I mean, did the, the damage yes. to the Conservative Party in the north of England, um, we could talk about Scotland as well, of... Thatcherism or the way uh, it came to be seen. I mean, what's the, what, what do you see as the legacy there? Does she bear any of the responsibility for the fact that subsequently the Conservative yeah. Party got wiped yeah. out in, in, yeah. in these parts of the country uh, and has only more recently started mm. to come back in some of them? What, where, where, where does the blame lie for that? Well, first of all, of course, um, Orgreave, you could say, was the northern powerhouse. I mean, <laughs> there was all yeah. the, the... There was a whole... That's why I was there, actually. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. Uh, but sadly, you were only about 16 at the time, so you couldn't give her the phrase, because it would have been tremendously <laughs> uh, useful uh, if she'd had it. Um, literally, the powerhouse, because all the coke was sitting there. Um, uh, I think... First of all, I think she had more uh, seats in the north than the Conservative Party does today. Yeah. Um, I think that's important to remember. Um, but I think that there was tremendous pain about something that had to happen, but there's still tremendous pain about it, which is sort of understandable, which was the end of old-fashioned heavy industry and utterly unionized heavy industry. And obviously the people who, who people did suffer from that. It had to happen, but they did suffer for it. And of course, they feel bitter about it. Um, the whole world really recognizes that it had to happen. And even in these places, it's recognised that it has to happen, but she's not going to get the credit for it. But it, is that it, because it, she did not demonstrate uh, sufficient sympathy? or I mean, it's interesting. If you go to well, the Nissan plant <coughs> in Sunderland, yeah. uh, there is actually the pictures of it opening, and there she is yes. yeah. uh, opening the plant, uh, yeah. and, get, you know, and she got the Japanese to come in and open the plant. But, of course, that's not maybe the story she wanted to tell, or maybe she tried to tell it and just failed. She didn't, though in some ways she's the most brilliant public performer and um, creator of her own myth, in another way she spent very, very little time thinking about presentation. I mean, because um, she was so busy getting on with everything. And Bernard Ingham would always say it's such a struggle to get her to pay the slightest attention to what's on the telly or what's in the media. And you know, I'm sure that's a problem with you and David Cameron as well. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> um, you know, you have so many things on your mind. We have no and, uh, idea what's uh, going on and, in the media. Uh, we don't pay and, any attention um, to and, it. Uh, <laughs> that's quite, quite. Um, and I think, I think that's, that was a bit of a problem with her, actually. Um, and also, she didn't want to... But it's a, hold on, this is, you know, she employs Tim Bell and Maurice Saatchi and Gordon Reese, and she's got Bernard Ingham. I mean, she's... Well, she didn't really employ them, you see, that's the thing. And not, not much when she was being Prime Minister, only for elections. Right. Um, and therefore, there's not many people spinning away for her uh, every day. Um, but it is an interesting thing. I mean, um, I think she didn't want... She sort of thought, well, why should I grovel at, um, mm -hmm. about this? Mm. Um, all this business about do you care... She believed you had to show that through actions and results rather than keep on saying. And in fact, what I do show is with the working mind that she did care. So she was very, very upset. Yes. About There's the, the story of the attack. letter, she That's said. a wonderful thing. Yeah. When she, well, tell the story she wrote a letter to a um, working miner's wife because she was worried that her, his, her husband uh, and she were sort of having tension about the strike. And she said, yeah, I want you to know how you're husband appreciates your support and what an awful time you're all having. And then she said, when she'd written the letter, she wrote a little note to the private office saying, Don't, please send this under plain envelope, because she understood that if this arrived, saying 10 Downing Street on the mm. envelope in a mining village, that there would be um, attack, literally physical attacks. Mm. And I thought that was an example of her thoughtfulness in small things and how she was actually thinking about what it was like for this woman in that situation. And were you... Um you, you've, you've mentioned, of course, many times uh, during this interview. I mean, the fact she's a woman is a, a key part of who she is as a prime minister. Uh, and you make an observation that, you know, she says, you know, a woman has to win the argument because yeah. uh, she feels that uh, otherwise that's a 
massive defeat for her. That she yes. Not, but, I mean, explain something about that. Well, that's to do with you know not being a public schoolboy, really, isn't it? I mean, and not being part of a club. Well, so, I wouldn't know. So. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so when um, when Boris comes in through, and the first thing he always says on all occasions is sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry, sorry. That's the first thing he says. Is he apologises. He doesn't for, say it to me. <laughs> 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 He will, he will. Um, but, uh, um, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, um, and Mrs. Thatcher didn't see why she should say sorry unless she was sorry. And it's her part of her sort of method is truthfulness. And the sense that she's got a woman, a woman leader, if she falls, she falls. Nobody catches her. So she's got to know everything, win everything. Yes. Um, and, and that's the way it is, and um, there's only one chance for a woman, is something she loved to say. Yes. And I, I think that, that was the secret of success, but also of why she drove people crazy, you know, why they got so utterly fed up. There's also her, uh, comes across throughout the book, of course, her uh, incredible um, stamina. Yeah. But does she, um, <clears throat> there's an attempt to kill her, of course, right at the heart of the book, um, yeah. the Brighton bomb. Mm. Um, does that change who she is? Uh, it changes the nature, I think, of uh, our premiership. It becomes a much more uh, protected, yep. secure thing from yep. then onwards, uh, even more so. And, uh, you know, the more and more police protection and she's more in a bubble, which, you know, prime ministers have lived in since. Mm -hmm. Does that, do you chart a, a change in her connection with people because of that? I think there was some because I think security does make it very difficult and they really were trying very hard to kill her. And it particularly meant, I think, that it was much harder just to sort of see people in the House of Commons in a... In a I think mm. Parliament suffered yes. from this. Um, Parliament's a pretty insecure building in those days, perhaps even now. And all that had to be much more uh, controlled. It didn't change policy much. I mean, there was about a month of hiatus of the Anglo-Irish Agreement, and then on it went. Um, I think it also gave perhaps a, a more of a, even more of a sense of mission. I mean, um, that, which is a big part of her religious belief, that you, there's no such thing as sort of uncovenanted time. You've got to, you have your duty, you've only got a certain amount of time, you must fill it in the right way um, to achieve important things. Uh, and Dennis gave her a watch after um, the bomb, which was inscribed with the words, every moment is precious. And uh, I think that's very much how she, how she saw things. And then you have, a, I thought, um, a, a brilliant sort of vignette, which is, thereafter, she carries a torch around in her yes. handbag. Yes. After the Brighton, but for the rest of her time. Is, is That's that right? correct, because of the lights going out with the explosion. Um, and this came in great use when she was flying from um, China, from Hong Kong to um, Camp David to see President Reagan. They land in Honolulu in the middle of the night, and on came the US top brass. And she said, oh, I'd love to see Pearl Harbor. And they said, well, we're sorry, it's right miles round the air, airport. It's close, but you have to drive right round, and it's dark. And, um, and she said, well, if it's so close, why can't we walk across the tarmac? And they said, well, OK, but it's dark. And she said, but I've got a torch in my bag. <laughs> and and, um, and um, so, so <laughs> um, off they walk with um, you know, Margaret Thatcher in her patent leather shoes and the torch and the American top brass, and go across to just as dawn's breaking over Pearl Harbor. Right. And of course, a brilliant piece of propaganda by her for them, you know, that she wanted to see Pearl Harbor, and yeah. then flew on to see Reagan. And on that flight, um, she doesn't sleep, does she? It's a, it, this is a 20, she refused to sleep, This is a 24-hour yes. flight yeah. from uh, Hong Kong to Washington. She, this is, I mean, yeah. uh, actually, this bit was serialized, but it, <clears> not, maybe not everyone has seen it. A, you capture this brilliant week in her life where she has... <laughs> Gorbachev at Checkers for mm. six hours. Mm -hmm. He's not yet General Secretary, but he's mm. the coming man in mm -hmm. the Soviet Union. Mm. She then flies to uh, China, to Beijing, to see Deng Xiaoping and uh, sign the agreement about Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And then she takes a 24-hour flight to Camp David. From Hong Kong, in fact. From yeah, Hong Kong, down, yeah. and refuses yeah. to sleep. Yeah. And, um, yeah. uh, and th so th is that, do you think, extraordinary or maybe, you know... That's what it took to be, a, or takes to be, the Prime Minister. I mean, what's... I mean, do you first, think, do you first think of all, it's a she particular did have, feature of her? She or? did have the most phenomenal mental and physical stamina, but also it was to do with wanting to prove it all the time. Right. 
But I think because Robin Butler says I'm going to go to bed, and she says, yes, she well, says I'm not. well, I'm not. I'm going to read. Which the... Must have been an awkward moment for yeah, Robin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, he also reveals that um, that's why she bought a house in Dulwich because um, he'd finally persuaded her to um, spend a weekend at Checkers doing nothing, and then she suddenly, as it came up this weekend. Um, she said, I shall die if I don't have some work to do. I think that was a, her phrase. So he took her off. Um, uh, that he thought she must have some activity. So he took her to see a hospice near him in Dulwich. And they, then they went, and he took her to supper. And um, they went for a little walk. And she saw this house, this new, new build villa, um, and um, decided to buy it on the spur of the moment, which was a total disaster. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, uh, there's an interesting, actually, just picking up on that, the, um, the people, you interviewed, obviously, uh, for, not for the first book and for this one, a whole um, range of people, not just the cabinet ministers, but uh, the detectives and the people, mm. who, the, the garden girls, and mm. all of that. Um, what, did, what are the people, the personal staff? I mean, are they... What is their recollection of her? Because actually, you, you actually say they didn't really enjoy working for her. They found it a bit of a, a nightmare at times. Um, I think you've got, is it Robin Butler saying, um, I dreaded sitting next to her and, um, and the like, and I couldn't relax. And yet, of course, they were fantastically loyal. Yes. What, what's uh, their attitude? Having spoken to so many of these people over recent years, what's... Uh, well, I think, actually, I think they did enjoy it. I, I, it's not quite right to say they didn't enjoy it. Of course, it was very, very stressful. Yeah. But um, basically, she was a wonderful person to work for and, and a pretty difficult person to work with. So there's a big contrast between cabinet colleagues, which is uh, really rather a nightmare, and um, staff of all levels, from detectives and doormen up to people like Robin Butler and Charles Pohl. And the reason for this is that, first of all, I think um, she gave and received loyalty. And this was a tremendously important thing with her. And secondly, that people thought um, this is worth it because this is a great adventure <laughs> and things are actually happening. And they knew uh, and, at the time. And, and that she inspired the whole of Whitehall with mm -hmm. that feeling. So funnily enough, despite her theoretical hatred of Whitehall, she really adored the top civil servants. Um, and the best of them love working with her. Something was really happening all the time. Now, you, um, we, we must uh, draw this to a close, but um, you, you've given an interview about um, the book, and uh, you say that David Cameron is the first Tory leader uh, to uh, essentially escape from her legacy. Yeah. Well, say something about that. Well, I think because of the fact that she was assassinated rather than losing an election, if you see what I mean, caused tremendous bad blood, which is still there, but is now less bad. And David Cameron, because of the passage of time and because of being younger, and also, I think, because of being rather astute about it, didn't have, to, it didn't have this awful dilemma, you know, do I repudiate her or do I accept her? He, he, he can sort of do both. Um, what Peter Mandelson, who I'm pleased to see here tonight, called the politics of both and rather, rather than either or in a different context. Um, and um, uh, I think um, that... Um, that sort of works. I mean, a lot of Thatcherites are still angry about David Cameron's way of dealing with that. But personally, I think this is, on the whole, an astute and wise thing to do. You've got to get the best out of Margaret Thatcher, but also to recognise, I think he said it himself, that um, you learn from a politician, but if they're a politician of a different era, you can't replicate what they did. And you'd be mad to try. And the thing about Mrs. Thatcher, part of her greatness is that she would never have used the word, and I don't like the word myself, she was a modernizer. Um, that's why she, she wasn't a do everything the same. She was do everything. I'm glad to hear you she, she, was, she, was, she was do everything. It's only taken 15 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she, um, she was an innovator, um, and the whole point was change. Um, and therefore, the people who say that you should do the same as what she did don't understand what yes. she was about. Yeah. No, and look, I remember when I got involved in the Conservative Party, it was all about who, how people had voted in that yeah. key leadership ballot. And it, it eventually it was just the passage of time as well that, yeah. uh, that helped. Yeah. Um, should she have uh, taken a leaf, uh, you know, if that was possible with a time machine, out of uh, David Cameron's book and quit after two terms? Um, uh, she, I, I think she should have um, quit when Dennis advised her, which is after 10 years. So um, I think... 
uh, and what, what uh, I think David Cameron was, is, is very sensible to, um, you know, not outstay his welcome, but very unwise to have said that, have said when it would happen. Because well, it, he's making your life very difficult, isn't he? I mean, you've got to run for, <laughs> you've got to run for four years, and, and we'll all churn it all You're over. Making some presumptions there. <laughs> <I can't go laughs> <into it. laughs> I mean, you, you know, now you've got all this thing. You could get in a Gordon Brown situation. Oh, I mean, no, hold on, I'm, I'm doing the interviewing here. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 um, but let me, let me. Uh, well, you actually, you, 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 you mentioned uh, Peter here in the front row. I mean, what would uh, I think a lot of people thought and have thought ever since uh, she left office that the arguments that she won were going to stay won yeah. um, on free markets and privatized industry and, and all of that. Um, do you, are you surprised that's all come back into British politics or are these, do these arguments have to be won by each generation and we, we got complacent? I think they do have to be won by each generation because nothing stays the same and something goes dramatically wrong. She, she won in 1979, particularly because things had gone dramatically wrong with a socialist idea of society. Mm. And then under uh, Gordon Brown, um, things went dramatically wrong with the capitalist idea of society. And it's still unresolved. I mean, you guys are sort of edging through into a better era, aren't you? But it's, there's still a great feeling of precariousness and there's a huge feeling all over the world, not just in Britain, that what's capitalism about? What are markets about? Who benefits and who loses? And these answers are not obvious. And while many people will think that Jeremy Corbyn is extremely poor standard bearer for all of this, the fact that he's got that position sort of indicates this, these anxieties. Um, and therefore, it does all need to be rethought and re-argued. Um, and it's not uh, given, the, the sort of, your party doesn't have the eternal right to rule. And when it thought it did, it you know, eventually realized that, that that meant that it lost it. Well, I agree with that. <laughs> and on that note, since hmm. it's still a, a capitalist economy and you can go and buy this book, yeah. I strongly <laughs> recommend <laughs> that you do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Very kind. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. If it goes wrong, you can get a job, but I can't. Well, I think that by common consent is the best double bill we've ever had in the history of uh, our organization. It's worked uh, absolutely brilliantly. It's almost uh, like uh, George Bernard Shaw in The Devil's Disciple, where the highwayman swaps places with the vicar, but I'm not sure which is quite which in, uh, in this particular uh, scenario. But uh, Charles and George, we stay on. We'll now go through. We'll have some drinks, and Charles will then sign some books after a half-hour gap and uh, refreshment after having been on the campaign trail like uh, Ronald Reagan, sort of uh, his vo voice almost giving way. But thank you, Charles. Thank you, George, for all your time. It's the audience here. Stalin once said in the matter of arms production, he said, uh, you know, eventually enough quantity becomes quality. But we have both quantity <laughs> and quality here tonight. So thank you all for coming. Thank you both. Thank you.